It's U of L today on 93.9 The Bill. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. And welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Bill. For those of you who've been with us before, you know that this is a show about stuff going on at the University of Louisville. Research, we talk to students, we talk about programming that's going on at uh, U of L. So hopefully you'll stick around for the next 30 minutes or so and maybe learn something about U of L. On the show today, we're going to be talking about beluga whales, cancer, and DNA. We'll also be talking to a U of L neurologist about burnout among doctors in her field. But first, many of you have asthma, and you're probably treating it with drugs and therapies. But maybe there's more to what's causing your asthma and other ways to treat it. Allison McLeish is a psychology professor who has looked at how anxiety might be playing a role in asthma and the functioning of the lungs. Allison, it's good to see you. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Was that a pretty good synopsis about that what you was. studied? Yeah, I'm, I can leave now, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm good. Take off. Don't need to talk anymore. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you study asthma, basically. Mm-hmm. All I do, right. Yes. And and but you're a psychology professor, so you're looking at asthma and psychology and wondering how those two go together. Right. Um, I actually my background uh, in graduate school was looking at panic disorder, and panic attacks and asthma attacks are very similar. And so as I went on in my training, I started to look at. Um, ways that we could take our understanding of panic attacks and look maybe at some of the psychological factors associated with asthma. All right. So you're not a medical doctor, but no, uh, no. <laughs> but but we can talk a little bit about asthma. What mm-hmm. is asthma? Explain it. Yep. Asthma is a um, an obstructive lung disease that um, involves sort of chronic inflammation of the airways. So your airways are always sort of swollen. And then we have on top of that sort of asthma attacks. So periods where you have even the, even further increased inflammation, the muscles around the airways kind of constrict and there's increased mucus production. And so that it produces the wheezing and some of the symptoms that we think of as pretty common among folks with asthma. All right. So that's when you see the folks with the inhaler. And right. Right. Kind of and, and they really, you know, experience a lot of distress and, and it's really anxiety provoking because, you know, it's no fun when you can't breathe. Right. Yeah, that, that, that would be true. <laughs> Breathing is important. <laughs> All right. So you, you've you looked at asthma from the aspect of, of psychology. And what have you found in terms of anxiety? depression, those kinds of things, what impact uh, could those have? Um, a pretty negative impact that we find that among folks with asthma, um, they are more likely to have anxiety and mood disorders, so they're more likely to be anxious and depressed. Um, and having those disorders makes their asthma worse is sort of overall what we see. Um, and that it makes it, um, just in general, they experience more symptoms. Um, it's harder for them to just achieve um, control. Um, asthma is not something we can cure, so it's, it's reliant on medication. Um, and um, even, and particularly with anxiety, what we see is that folks um, often sort of overperceive their symptoms or perceive their symptoms as worse than they really mm-hmm. are. And so they will sometimes overuse their medications. Um, and so there, there's a lot of, um, you know, thinking their asthma is worse than it really is. And it can sort of just spiral into uh, more problems. Mm. And, and so you, you've done a couple different studies mm-hmm. that I'm aware of, maybe two or three, four or five, I don't know, however many studies you've done on this. Uh, issue. And and who are the kind of people that you looked at? Were these just asthma sufferers? Were they smokers? Were they non-smokers? Uh, who are the folks that you had in your research study? Um, in the studies that, that we were, you know, that, that you sort of contacted me about were non-smokers. Um, so they're non-smokers, adults with asthma. I've also done some work on smokers with asthma. When I initially got into this work, I thought, okay, come on, these people have a lung disease. They're not going to be smokers. And actually, individuals with asthma are more likely to smoke than those without. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. That well, what's a, the psychology a, of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, you know I might I might win a lot of money if, if I figure that one out. Um, I win the prize, but um, you know there, I think there's a you know there's a a lot of sort of thoughts that I've had about that in terms of people start smoking when they're adolescents and adolescents with asthma might be like I don't want to you know pretend like I have this this chronic illness I want to be like everybody else and prone to peer pressure and those types of things and then we know once you start smoking it's just gotcha. hard to quit and we also know that if you have anxiety and depression it's also really hard to quit smoking and if that's more common among asthma then. You know, it gets to be a really, really difficult picture. Yeah, we're talking with Allison McLeish. She's a psychology professor at U of L, who's looking at how anxiety might be playing a role in uh, in asthma. And so, you do find that there, people get depressed, they get anxious about having these attacks. But is it a daily basis that that people are worried, and that impacts their asthma when they do have an attack? In other words, oh man, you know, I'm hoping I don't have an attack today. Is that 
anxiety that these folks with asthma are feeling sort of their on anything, a daily like, basis like their anxiety about their their right, own asthma right. um what we've been really looking at is more just broad-based anxiety sort of a general tendency to worry just be more anxious about things not just asthma but sort of everything um sort of the worry warts mm-hmm. type of type of things and that that um and it doesn't even have to be specific to asthma but just just the tendency to worry um and be more anxious it has a lot of physiological responses that your body you know tends to to produce all sorts of physiological responses that can also impact asthma mm-hmm. so that's bad obviously yeah for yeah. these for these folks did you find that a majority of asthma sufferers have these um anxious moments and depression those kinds of things um what we see is about a third of, of asthma patients tend to um, have anxiety disorders in addition to that um, but even more um, than that that people will have sort of risk factors for anxieties and weight anxiety disorders and mood disorders ways of thinking that sort of um have make them have a tendency to catastrophize about their asthma symptoms, which, of course, is going to make things worse. Of course, the million-dollar question is, all right, you're one of those one-third of asthma sufferers who have anxiety, whatever. What do you do about it? Oh, it's, you know, I don't know. There's nothing. No. Um, <laughs> nothing uh, nothing you can do. That's no. why it's a million-dollar um, question, right? That's right. That's right. Um, well, there are several things that, that we can do. Um, you know, if the person has a disorder, an anxiety disorder in addition to their asthma, we can treat the disorder using therapy, um, particularly with anxiety disorders. Um, you know, it doesn't need to be a medication-based um, treatment that it can be therapy um, and treated in a couple of months. And, and, um, and that will really both help with their anxiety as well as their asthma symptoms. Um, what I've been looking at are thing are, are sort of prevention things of things that we can let's look at some factors that before the person develops the disorder could we intervene on those factors um, and help them um, sort of both improve their or decrease their risk for anxiety and improve their asthma outcomes and so we have some really um, again in sort of the investigational stage but some really brief sort of computerized treatments which are great that most of these folks are going to you know their asthma doctors pulmonary clinics they're not necessarily in a psychologist's office so these are things that don't take up a doctor time um, that can be done online um, and really can be very effective in helping folks. Okay, we're talking with Allison McLeish, who's a psychology professor at the University of Louisville. And, and when you're talking about the anxiety and treating these folks without drugs, Aren't you talking about mindfulness and relaxation exercises, those kinds of things? Or what are you talking about? Oh, not necessarily. Mindfulness is one approach um, that that is used to, to treat anxiety and mood disorders. I tend to um, do what's called an exposure-based approach. Um, one of the, the really great treatments for a lot of anxiety disorders is to do what you're afraid of. Um, and it's just, yeah, um, what you're avoiding is to stop doing that. Um, but the idea being, um, particularly with, with disorders related to physical symptoms, is to get them used to those physical symptoms so they don't freak out about them and so they don't become more anxious which then just makes them worse Um, and so there are some treatments that we can adapt for folks with asthma that we do um, for individuals with panic disorder that involve um, inducing panic symptoms Um, so we might have somebody breathe through a straw for as long as possible and experience that anxiety and kind of that freak out and then sit with it until they get used to those symptoms. Um, and so, so that's- they see you're gonna be okay. Yeah, and, and realize it's part of the sort of disproving. A lot of times people get really anxious and so they avoid everything that makes them anxious and they never learn, oh, I can deal with this. This isn't gonna kill me. Um, and and I'll be, I might be uncomfortable, but I'll be okay. Um, is sort of getting them used to those types of things. So this is experience and attack the problem head on. Mm-hmm, exactly. That, that's what you're talking yep. about here. Yep. And, and do you do that, again, just with asthma folks, or is it, it works for anybody who might have these kind of symptoms that might uh, in, be impacting them physiologically? Um, it works with, it doesn't even have to be impacting you physiologically. I mean, with any sort of anxiety symptoms, tar- it, the, the physiological exposure pieces, you know, that goes more with um, with anxiety, uh, with panic attacks and, and um, other physical problems that involve that. But really with any anxiety disorder, they're, some, they're avoiding something. They're not doing something. And so getting them to do whatever it is that they're avoiding is is really helpful. How'd you get interested in asthma? Do you have asthma or somebody in I your family not. have asthma? I do not. I do not. Part of it was when I was um, in my training on my postdoctoral fellowship, my mentor um, was getting interested in that. And so I was sitting in on, on some meetings and and they were talking about asthma, and I was starting to see this this interaction between asthma attacks and panic attacks. But also, I have a very good friend who also has very severe asthma, and so um, in sort of conversations with her about that was also, and just in Louisville, um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's the it's the hotbed of it's like I think it's the top five, the fifth, you know, worst city to live in if you have asthma. So, um, so it's also very common um, and pretty problematic. All right. So, what's next for you? What's the next big research project? You know, 
um, probably now that we're starting to understand these risk factors is to really sort of hone in on those those treatments and really they, the treatments have been developed for people more with anxiety issues and trying to sort of adapt them for an asthma population. Gotcha. All right. Allison McAleese. Nice to meet you. Right, nice Good luck meet with you your well. research. Appreciate Thank you very it. Very much. John Wise is a pharmacology professor at U of L who has sailed the ocean blue, <laughs> studying the impact of pollution on whales, and he's here today to talk about cancers in beluga whales and what he's learned that might help humans solve the mysteries of cancer. John, good to see you back. Good to see you too. So where have you been recently? What what uh, ocean have you been on in the uh, last most year or recent, so? Most recently, I was down in the swamps and lakes of Florida catching alligators. <laughs> the Everglades? Them. No, we didn't get down to the Everglades, but we were, we were at um, Lake Apopka, which is a heavily polluted lake, and Lake Woodruff, which is a fairly clean lake, and then Kennedy Space Center, <laughs> and comparing the three. Right, um, right. All right, so you're a pharmacology professor. You do research. Uh, what kind of research do you do? We're studying how pollutants in the environment cause cancer um, and affect uh, DNA. DNA of, um, of whales or other creatures or humans? Humans, whales, sea turtles, alligators, okay. um, a, whole, a whole variety of, of, of species to try to better understand cancer in general. And you're also under this new umbrella organization we've got called the Envirome Institute at the University of Louisville. That's so I guess correct. you're probably going to have to explain what that is a little bit. Well, the Vi- Envirome Institute is a new institute that's been formed at the University of Louisville to focus on the environment and to think about, it, think about environmental health from a holistic point of view. And you came here, what, two years ago, three years no, ago? How long have you been, been here? F- uh, four and a half. Oh, now. remember. I had, <laughs> I had you on the show when you first got here. That's uh, like four like years. Yesterday. Wow, yeah. that's a long time. Okay. Yeah. So you've been at U of L for four years, and you brought with you this uh, interest in this research on whales. So why don't you talk about that a little bit, what you, what you do and what you're looking for? Well, we're using whales as a sentinel for, for human health. Um, we got into it because whales have very long lifespans, and of course they're very large, but they have, they have really low rates of cancer. Now, part of that may be that if a whale gets cancer, you just don't see it because something eats it. But there are populations that are intensely studied, and they just don't see very high rates of cancer. So we wanted to ask the question, what is it about whales that they've evolved that protects them from cancer that we can then use to better understand human health? And then along the way, we, we, we realized whale health was poorly understood as well. So we started to look you know, at the intersection of human health and, and whale health and using our human data in form about how whales might be affected. And you're specifically looking at metals in the ocean, in the water, right? That's our predominant focus, yes. Mm-hmm. We've done some work with oil and chemical dispersions as a result of the Gulf of Mexico crisis, but our predominant focus is metals in the environment. Okay, and so you found that those metals cause whales which don't have a lot of cancer in it but can cause cancer in in whales right no it's you slightly different that, op- um, we, we have okay. the study in belugas which show that a class of chemicals called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons <laughs> yeah it's got um, it's got to have an acronym what's the acronym name? the acronym is PAH. Oh, okay well that's we, a little we, easier we've to shown that those are causing cancer in beluga whales okay gotcha the metals however and the other whales we're finding that the whales do appear to be resistant even on a cellular level so we have work showing that whales may have better DNA repair than humans do. So we might be able to to adapt something for you know human intervention based on those findings. Talking with John Wise, pharmacology professor at the University of Louisville, who uh, does uh, well, he does a lot of research out in the ocean <laughs> with whales and and other animals. And as you heard, he talked about crocodiles and alligators. I guess that you're looking at down in Florida. So when you're talking about the DNA, though, that's a really interesting study because if if some things can alter the DNA of whales, I think is what you're saying, right? Mm-hmm. It's possible to perhaps alter the DNA of humans so that they could fight off cancer. Is that what you're getting at? Well, yeah. Or explain we, it to we, me. We know that metals can it can impact DNA in humans and whales. The question is, how does the cell respond? So, if a whale is exposed, so we we have shown that whales are exposed to levels of metals that you find in humans who get lung cancer from those metals. Mm -hmm. So it looks like whales have an occupational dose of metal exposure, Mm -hmm. but yet they're not getting cancer. So so why is that? And and it looks like they've developed ways to fix the damage that humans can't either can't do or do less efficiently and thus avoid the problem of cancer. So as we, if we can understand how they're, how they're fixing it better, then you can design a drug or an intervention 
to give to humans to try to fix fix their DNA better as well. Yeah, it's all kind of fascinating. And, and, and you've looked at other natural disasters as well and what impact those have had on on whales and other mammals, correct? Uh, well, the big one we focused on is the Deepwater Horizon accident. And that was uh, when? How long ago was that? 2010. It's almost almost uh, 10 years ago. It's, it's been a while. So yeah. you looked at 2010, so you looked at the Deepwater accident. And what did you find in terms of how it impacted the ocean life and the whales? Well... Um, it's not just, I mean, there's a lot of people working on it, but it's very mm-hmm. clear that it's had a significant impact on the respiratory health of the animals from inhaling a lot of the fumes and inhaling the oil. We found really high levels of metals in the immediate aftermath of the accident that then trail off as in, in out years. We're actually hoping to go back um, in 2020, which would be sort of the 10 year anniversary and see if things have come back to a more normal level for those animals. And see if basically filtered out of the water that, that there's been so much water over the dam, bad, bad right. analogy there, right, but right. Uh, uh, there's been enough water that yeah, has, has sucked up all the, the metals and all the other things that may be in the waters and the pollution in the right. water that the whales are coming back to life. Right, to see if, you know, if the environment has cleaned itself up as you know 10 years later, or if it's still persisting. Mm-hmm. What were you doing with the crocodiles? The crocodiles are, well, it's alligators. Alligators, sorry. Actually, There's a difference. We're actually, yeah, there is a little <laughs> bit of a difference. <laughs> Let's see, which um, one? Uh, crocodiles have the wide snout, alligators have the narrow snout, uh, right? Well, crocodiles are bigger. Okay. And, okay. Uh, and crocodiles are more aggressive. Okay. Um, and so we're on actually, the golf course in Florida, stay away from the crocodiles is what well, you're trying both. to say. Well, both. <laughs> well, both. And we're, uh, we're actually starting to do crocodile work, but our focus has been alligators. It's something we do in collaboration with NASA. Um, they're using the alligators as a sentinel for um, the environment at Kennedy Space Center and in Florida because as the environment is changing and getting more complicated, alligators being reptiles and top predators are going to be among the first to experience sort of health effects as a result of the climate. So we are studying them first as a baseline to see, you know, what do they look like now and then to see how they're changing over time. What do you think you'll find? I think we're going to find that things are going to get worse over time because as, as the environment is shifting, the pollutants that were in the sediment can become more available. The, the huge rainstorms that we have are making our water um, collection systems be overrun so we can't filter the pollutants out of the rainwater as well. So we're going to get more exposures going on. That's what I think we're going to find. We're talking with John Wise, pharmacology professor at UofL, who runs his own institute. It's, I think it's called, is it the Wise Institute or the Wise Center? Oh, no, I have my own laboratory. Oh, so own laboratory. The Wise Laboratory. The Wise Laboratory, okay. Yeah. And he's also part of the Envirome Institute at the at the University of Louisville, which talks about there and looks at the uh, impact of the environment on human health. So what's next for you? What, uh, what's the next big project? The next big project, um, well, well, we'll be in the Gulf of Maine in the fall. Um, I didn't even know Maine had a Gulf. What's the Gulf of Maine? <laughs> well, it's the wa- it's the ocean off of Maine and Massachusetts. Okay. We have a long-term study there of humpback whales and fin whales, um, and we're finding a lot of pollution in those animals as well. Um, not all whales are polluted. We've worked down in Argentina, and actually those whales have fairly low levels of pollutants, and we've worked up in Alaska, and some of those whales have low levels of pollutants. But the ones in the Atlantic – which includes the Gulf of Mexico, seem to have very high levels of pollution. Okay, so you're going back up there just to uh, do a double check on these animals? Uh, yeah, it's sort of an ongoing to see how it's changing over time. Okay. Um, and we have an ongoing study of sea turtles in Vieques, Puerto Rico, which is a small island off the main island of Puerto Rico that the Navy used as a bombing target for about 50 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're seeing if the turtles there have elevated metals possibly as a result of leftover uh, munitions. I remember asking you this whenever the last time was you were on the show three, four years ago, and, and I thought it was kind of a fun answer. What does a guy like you who studies the oceans, <laughs> what are you doing at the University of Louisville, which is landlocked, and the closest body of water is the Ohio River? And we're bringing the oceans to Louisville. <laughs> um, people in Louisville like whales, and we also like seafood, and the whales certainly are indicative of, of – the quality of the seafood that we may be getting. Um, and I think everybody's starting to understand that the environment is a global environment, and we rely on the oceans to be healthy for the rest of us to be healthy. And you'd like to do some research on the Ohio River, right? Yes, we are trying to develop a, a One Health type project with the Ohio River to try to understand how the, this, how the health of people in Louisville is affected by the health of the river. 
Okay. But that's in its conception. infancy. Yes. It's very, in its infancy. Very that's infancy. down the road a little ways. Yeah. All right. John Wise, it's always great talking to you. Glad you're doing well at the University of Louisville and your kids are doing well. And, uh, Hope to see you back here okay. talking more about your research. We hear stories all the time about various professions with a high rate of burnout in their ranks. Teachers, journalists, and maybe even overnight truck drivers come to mind. But what about doctors, specifically neurologists? Dr. Kathleen Lefevre studies the brain and is a neurologist at UofL, and she has looked at this burnout issue. Dr. Lefevre, good to have you on the show. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you. Burnout among neurologists. Is it bad? <laughs> is it a bad problem? <laughs> yeah, so burnout has been a bit of a buzzword, and I think more attention has been paid to it in physicians in the past five years or so. And then there's been a number of studies showing that, yes, physicians are at a high rate for burnout. And uh, so a study done among neurologists in 2016 showed that 60% of those who answered had at least one symptom of burnout. Now, the way 60, the, 6, 0%? Uh -huh, yeah, it, very high. So, uh, and uh, in some other studies, kind of uh, that kind of uh, for a reason, the study was done by the American Academy of Neurology was that neurologists have been found to rank among those physicians high at highest risk with uh, highest rate. So consistently over 50% in several studies. And the way this was measured was with the so-called Maslach burnout inventory. And it had burnout according to, to that instrument as three dimensions, um, and one is uh, exhaustion, emotional exhaustion, uh, so just, well, feeling kind of at the end of your rope, <laughs> depersonalization, so that means that you might, you know, experience something stressful and, and not even really kind of um, be fully engaged because you're just um, detached, mm -hmm. you get more detached, and then the last component was a lack of personal accomplishment or feeling of personal accomplishment. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, that has been labeled sort of a crisis for, for medicine that a lot of physicians seem to be affected by burnout. And you're a neurologist and you've written about this issue. Uh, is it from personal experience? Are you burning out? <laughs> no, so I think what really got me interested in the issue, so besides from doing my day job here, I am administrator of a online group for women neurologists uh, that has about uh, 2,100 members. And when this initial study from the AN was published in 2016, a lot of our members were saying, well, gosh, they didn't even measure the, re the reasons re I am burned out. Uh, so the survey did this kind of standard instrument, the Maslach inventory. But what we did not look is actually gender factor. So they did not ask about, well, how many children do you have? They did not ask about pay. Um, and uh, another factor that's probably contributing to burnout is uh, um, um, uh, pay gap. And there's been, um, again, a study showed that unfortunately neurology was um, uh, number one of having a pay gap between male and female physicians, on average $30,000 per year. Oh, wow. um, so, you know, and these factors were actually not asked for. So no um, pay difference, family responsibilities. You know, a lot of women struggle between, you know, especially um, as you're in your younger family kind of founding years. <laughs> There's a lot of added responsibilities. Caring for parents often fall, falls more on the women. So, so basically, what we did after kind of hearing some of these some of these uh, comments made by many women was uh, actually approaching these offers of a burnout survey and ask them, well, did you look at gender factors? And they got interested and got me involved. And so we did a, a reanalysis of some of these factors. And then a lot of more outside factors that didn't have to do with the day to day job, with the paperwork and seeing patients and those kinds of things was other stuff, right? That's causing so, perhaps burnout among female Right, so that is true. So what, what, what we did find is that uh, on the first glance, it looked like burnout is more common in, in women. There was a 64% risk of burnout versus 57 in male. However, once it was adjusted for age, um, that kind of different disappeared and looked like just younger age in general. So being under 40 had a higher risk for burnout. Now, in addition to just the um, number games, we also looked at qualitative comments. So the very last question of that long survey was, do you have any additional comments to make? And that's where people sometimes really poured their heart out, <laughs> as you can imagine, and kind of voiced frustrations, what they really felt kind of, this is kind of why I do feel so bad. And a lot of it, so then we 
there's uh, methods to qualitatively assess, you know, are there differences and what are the main factors? So these things were all coded by neurologists and, and some non-neurologists who had experience with that. Um, and so what we found is, yes, some factors were the same in men and women, and people or physicians were frustrated by um, having, you know, less aut autonomy in their job, being kind of more told by administration what to do, you insurance know, all companies. these insurance companies, all these things, just kind of this lack of autonomy in, in their job, and I think that is a huge problem. Now, some additional things that women were saying, um, they did feel they had to do more unpaid work, and they got less support. Um, so in terms of unpaid work, additional teaching responsibilities, maybe sitting on uh, running some, some things, unpaid committees or things like that, and um, had less administrative support. Right. And um, in addition, you know, issues like lack of support for or maternity leave, or you know, maybe even just more subtle gender biases. You know, comments that are being made, and they're just kind of feeling to you know, mm -hmm. feeling erosive right, <laughs> after right. you hear things over and over again. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the bottom line was um, again, gender was not a major predictor of burnout. It seemed to be more burnout is more common in younger neurologists, uh, but the qualitative, the experience of the workplace, there definitely are differences in men and women, and I think uh, we all should aim <laughs> to hopefully change these things and to make the workplace for physicians uh, a more gender-neutral experience. Talking with Catherine LeFevre, who studies the brain and is a neurologist at the University of Louisville. We're talking about burnout among neurologists. How does this impact patients? <laughs> so that's a very good question. And there have definitely been studies shown that physicians who are burned out are more prone to make errors. Um, and, um, you know, you can imagine if your physician struggles with burnout and there's also a higher uh, link to depression or even suicidality, you know, it's a whole other topic. Suicidality in physicians has also been on the rise. Uh, so, yes, I mean, I think it does. Um, it could uh, negatively affect patient care. And this is why this uh, topic should should absolutely be taken serious. Are more doctors, and not just neurologists uh, like yourself, but more doctors uh, uh, willingly going to psychologists and others to try and uh, deal with the, the burnout issue in a straight-on fashion? Well, you know, I think it's it's a, it's a time issue, and you know, feeling burned out doesn't necessarily mean one has a psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, yeah, all the I know, time. but I mean, it's, right. it's good to talk to somebody about it. I assume, right? <laughs> So, um, you know, it, the issue is pretty complex because uh, so since this whole burnout um, crisis has been looked at or has been kind of in the news, I think a lot of institutions have tried to react and, for example, offer wellness initiatives and offer meditation classes and yoga and all these things. And, you know, I think while this is very well-meaning, it's not enough. And, um, you know, I think looking more at the really the underlying reasons would be the most important step to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, again, if you look at what's driving the burnout is the, the lack of autonomy, the lack of support. I, I think, uh, you know, sometimes it, it, it drives a bit of a uh, opposite reaction. It's like, well, you know, if I'm already completely overworked and catching up every night on closing my charts after my actually end of a work day and after dinner, I don't need a psychologist or I don't need a yoga class. What I need is actually a work time that is time. feasible <laughs> uh, so I can, you know, and have administrative support and, and um, you know, if I'm working in an academic setting but have a lot of RVU pressure and I'm still expected to do a lot of the teaching on the side sort of thing, you know, without having adequate time for it, you know, these are factors that need to be looked at and that need to be addressed. And unfortunately, that's not easy. All right. Dr. Kathleen LeFevre, always great to have you on the program. Appreciate it. We'll Very see good. you again soon, I'm sure. Thank you so much <laughs> for right. asking about the study. <laughs> All right, that'll about do it for this edition of UofL Today with Mark Hebert, which you can hear every Monday and Tuesday night at 6 on 93.9 The Ville. You can also listen to the podcast of the shows on SoundCloud or watch the programs on Metro TV or KETKY throughout the week or on UofL's YouTube channel anytime you want to go to the YouTube channel. Check out all the UofL News videos and events at uoflnews.com. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to UofL Today with Mark Hebert. And go Cards!